Massachusetts were really concerned with how it was. That's it. Like my parents told me that, and they're like, it was ridiculous. <laughs> Today's speaker, Connor Dacey, will be uh, presenting his master's degree work for us. Connor came to us from Florida State University uh, in 2015 when he began his master's degree work here in that fall. And those of us on the 14th floor have grown quite accustomed to his jovial nature, his, uh, as well as his rantings about the felony-free nature of Florida State football <laughs> and the indefatigable, though sometimes underinflated New England Patriots. Uh, <laughs> but he's always in a good mood. I can honestly tell you, I can't think of a time in these two years where I've ever seen you even look remotely concerned about anything. I'm sure that isn't true, but that's what it looks like to me, and it's a skill I wish I had. I am very jealous of that. I don't have it. FSU Miami games. <laughs> <laughs> the FSU Miami games. Yeah. <laughs> well, I can imagine sporting events. Yeah. <laughs> See, I understand that with Connor. That's a whole different realm. I, I don't accept know. anything of that. <laughs> so, but I've never seen him upset, so congratulations on that. It's a very enviable skill. During your first winter here, I remember you struggled with our um, somewhat more difficult, but infinitely more interesting climate, uh, and uh, complained a little bit. So I thought this morning, we were just joking about it, how perfect Connor is his defense on a day when the high temperature may not get to 55 degrees. Uh, perfect in August. But his resolve was rewarded when in early March of that very first year, this fantastic flooding event occurred in the South Central United States, and he's been unraveling the mystery about it ever since. So. I'm going to let him say more about that as we go. Uh, but Connor is going to be leaving us at the end of next week, and he's off to the University of Delaware, the Fighting Blue Hens. Um, pretty bad. But uh, to study emergency management, because he's always had a particular interest in disaster management. And he's going to get, I think that's right, you're going to get to use the very same case that you're possible. talking about uh, to, to, to um, continue with your PhD, but from a different perspective. So that's really great. But as I said, it was a great pleasure working with Connor over these last couple of years. He's got a really buoyant personality, somebody you'd like to be around, you'd like to have in your group, and we're going to miss him in the group. But I look forward to his presentation today, multi-scale dynamical diagnosis of the South Central U.S. flood of March 2016. So Connor, take it away. Thank you, John, for that very uplifting <laughs> introduction. So as John mentioned, uh, my name is Connor Dacey, and the title of my talk today is a multi-scale dynamical diagnosis of the South Central U.S. flood of March 2016. And you can see here, these are just two images from this event. So we see New, New Augusta, Mississippi, and Mooringsport, Louisiana, just showing some of the flooding that did occur in these locations. You can see the water, how high it reached in just a couple uh, of these towns. So we'll just jump right on in to our general overview and motivation. So what exactly was this all about? So it was a large impact weather event that occurred between March 8th and March 12th, 2016, and it was characterized by a deep trough that was eventually located over southern Mexico. Associated with this trough was over two plus feet of rainfall in the states of Louisiana, Texas, and Mississippi, but uh, additional rainfall was also recorded in uh, Tennessee and other states around the area as well. And there were also severe elements associated with this case that made it really interesting, including uh, seven EF1 confirmed tornadoes, and also a hail event. There were multiple reports of baseball and softball sized hail. And additionally, there were also uh, straight line wind damage reports that were associated with squall lines that did develop in association with this uh, significant weather event. And unfortunately, due to all of these um, severe elements, there were four deaths that were officially recorded and about $350 million and damages to uh, business and residential neighborhoods. And again, here is just another image from Franklinton, Louisiana, uh, the state that was most hard hit from this event. And you can show the water line just almost reaching the roofs of some of these houses. So quite a significant flooding event. Um, National Weather Service actually called it a one in 500 to one in 1,000 uh, year event. So very interesting and uh, really impactful event. So if we look spatially right here, so what you're seeing here is a spatial plot of the rainfall totals greater than about five centimeters, so two inches of rainfall. And we can see a large swath of this rainfall occurring over the south central U.S. and specifically focused on Louisiana, uh, receiving great number of uh, reports of rainfall. And including the Shreveport Regional Airport that actually received over 45 centimeters of rainfall. We had Schwartz, Louisiana that received upwards of 60 centimeters <coughs> of rainfall. And finally, we have 
Bush, Louisiana, that received about 35 centimeters of rainfall. So great number of uh, rainfall, rainfall rates and rainfall totals associated with this event, uh, with exceptions in far southeastern, southwestward um, Louisiana. And so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to just take you through a synoptic evolution of this. I realize it's a lot to see, just bear with me. So we're going to go through the five days event starting at 08 March. And what you see here, so panel A shows the 300 hectopascal geopotential uh, high isotacks. And uh, panel B shows the 500 hectopascal geopotential heights in black. And then in red you see the, the corresponding isentropes. And uh, C, panel C is the exact same thing as panel B, but instead of at eight, uh, 500 hectopascals, we're going down a level to 850. And then finally we have sea level pressure contour here. Um, and panel D. So what we can see when we begin at 08 March, we see that we do have this uh, jet streak that's located right off the Baja California Peninsula. And at 500 hectopascals, we can actually see this closed contour, this trough developing right over Southern California. Uh, but I think it's interesting to note that at least on this day, both at the lower levels, 850 and at the surface, we don't really see this uh, <coughs> signature of a uh, trough developing or a cyclone developing. But we do see really clearly in both, especially at the sea level pressure, uh, these two anti-cyclones located in the Pacific and the Atlantic Oceans, um, which I think uh, are interesting to uh, look for when I'm discussing the synoptic evolution. So we go 24 hours later, um, so this is 0Z on the 9th now, we see that our jet streak that was located right off the Baja California Peninsula has actually gone down to the southeast and propagated to the southeast, and we notice that our 500 hectopascal geopotential height uh, show a closed contour uh, located right over northwestern Mexico. And finally now at this time, we do actually get a signature at the lower levels and at the sea level pressure, but we notice that we do have a uh, local minimum at 850 hectopascals and again about 1,000 hectopascal uh, uh, low pressure center located right over uh, southwestern Mex uh, Texas and northern Mexico. So we do just start to develop this kind of westward tilt with height at about this time, and this actually continues 24 hours later uh, at 0Z on the 10th, where again our jet streak is now propagating to the south, uh, southeast again and wrapping around the base of the trough. Our trough you can see pretty well being more cut off from the main flow, being propagated very far to the south. This is actually the time in which the upper level trough reaches its most southern latitude of about 37 degrees north. And again, we do see slight indications at 850 and again at sea level pressure of uh, a signature of a cyclone that did develop. And again, we do notice, again, this uh, westward tilt with height, which I will talk about more later. Um, but we do uh, see a little bit of a presence with that. And again, located right about 37 degrees north. On the 11th, as we go again one day later, now our trough actually begins to kind of stay stationary, if not lift a little bit more to the northeast. We see that it is now located approaching far southern tip of Texas, with our jet streak pretty much being stationary from where it was about one day ago. But now we start to lose a little bit more of the, the uh, signature at the lower levels. We see, still kind of see a closed contour located at 850, but at the surface we kind of see that this cyclone actually opened up into an open wave. And that is actually the trend that does continue right onto the 12th, where our jet streak actually weakens and our upper level trough at 500 hectopascals moves to the northeast. But then at 850 and at the surface, we see that at these, lo at these levels both of the times, the cyclone actually just opened back into the wave and it's continued to be drawn to the northeast. And uh, th that's really significant and interesting because then it tells me immediately that the upper level, uh, that this trough is characterized mostly by the upper level, and we'll actually get more into how we analyze that uh, later in this talk. But what I really wanted to mention is how significant was the southern latitude of the cyclone. And so what you see here are the 500 hectopascal geopotential heights contoured in black and the standardized anomalies that are shaded. So we can see here at 0Z on the 8th, we have our about a 2 sigma geopotential height anomaly event. 24 hours later, at on the 9th, we see that this anomaly actually increases to about a 6 um, standard deviation event. And then again, by its most <coughs> southern latitude at 0Z on March 10th, we actually have like a 12 sigma um, event. So quite an anomalous event, very interesting event. Again, going back to what National Weather Service said about a 1 in 500, 1 in 1,000 year event makes it a really interesting case to study. So because of these factors, we really wanted to get into, one, what is the large-scale evolution that led to the development and southern propagation of the upper-level trough? And two, 
what were the mechanisms that were involved in producing the record-breaking rainfall for eastern Texas and Louisiana, and I'm going to specifically focus on March 10th um, for reasons that I will describe later on in this presentation. So we go and tackle the research question number one. What I first want to talk about is uh, the 400 hectopascal geopotential cold air infection that did occur in this region. So what are you seeing here? This is the United States. This is the California coast. What I have here shaded for you is the geostrophic cold air infection that's shaded. You have your geopotential height lines uh, contour, and then also your, uh, your isentropes that are also uh, dashed in red. And what we notice here is we have a, a northwesterly flow here. We have this geostrophic cold air infection occurring. And that's really important and really interesting because prior research has actually shown that in regions of geostrophic cold air infection in cyclonic shear, which we are in, you can actually get the development of an upper level front. So I'm going to give you just a brief history of an upper level front. So upper level fronts, the early investigations uh, started back in the 1950s. Um, some really interesting uh, papers and studies that came out of that were by Reed and Sanders in 1953, followed by Reed in 1955. And what they found was that uh, lower stratospheric air was actually um, found via radiosound data and other types of methods in the middle and upper troposphere. And they were really curious as to how that occurred, and they actually hypothesized that it was due to strong subsidence that was occurring to the, um, located near the warm boundary. And uh, because of the subsidence shifting towards the warm boundary, you get this kind of tilting of the isentropes in the middle and upper troposphere. And this isentropic gradient that does increase actually became what is now known as the tilting chronogenesis theory. And I will talk to you more about that as we go along. But pretty much what happened was further investigation between the 1960s and 1980s really got into this uh, mode of looking at uh, upper tropospheric fronts and the tilting front of just theory. And Shapiro in 1981 actually came up, uh, his study actually made this nice diagram that shows what it looks like to have an upper tropospheric front. So that's what you see here as an upper tropospheric front. You can see these bundles of isentropes that are actually sloping down from about 400 hectopascals to about 700 hectopascals. And we can also get a lower uh, stratospheric front that is going to be outside the scopes of this talk. But we really, I really want you to just like remember this image and focus on that image because you'll see that in this case specifically, we do actually get a development in an upper level front. And I'll talk about that in just a minute. But this led then to the sawyer eliasson equation. So Sawyer in 1956 uh, actually went and calculated the 1D version of these atriotrophic circulations. And then Eliasson in 1962 expanded on that, and together they get this wonderful looking equation. And it is a, uh, it's a second order uh, partial differential equation that accounts for the 2D atriotrophic stream function. Um, and it, it just get, really gives us a really uh, like quantitative sense of how exactly these atriotrophic circulations are occurring and uh, interesting aspects uh, related to them. And it's actually interesting too is that uh, prior studies uh, that I just mentioned and so forth, we actually, and Lang and Martin 2012, they noticed that again in certain regions of geostrophic temperature infection you can actually get the shifting of the subsidence and shifting of the core quadrant model to look different. So originally this is our, our traditional jet streak model where we have our regions of uh, rising motion and subsidence, but in the regions of geostrophic cold air infection along the jet, we actually notice that our subsidence associated with the jet is actually uh, shifted to directly underneath the jet core, to the jet core. And conversely, for geostrophic warm air infection, we see that we have rising motion located at the core of the jet. So for our case specifically, oh sorry, so formation of the geostrophic, as I mentioned, cyclonic shear northwesterly flows to Kaiser and Pechnik again, uh, really emphasized that this uh, shifting of the, the, temperature, the temperature infection that occurred across the front and the shifting of the subsidence can really influence uh, the overall uh, tilting of the isotropes and again support this tilting chronogenesis theory. And interestingly enough, Martin 2014 offered a different perspective uh, that really characterized it by negative uh, vorticity infection by the thermal wind. Uh, was actually related more to the subsidence in, con in uh, collaboration with the former, um, the former understanding of the shifting of the subsidence uh, due to this geostrophic temperature infection. But I think it is important to mention that because of the subsidence that's occurring, because of this geostrophic temperature infection, you get subduction. So the subsidence will help the subduction of high potential vorticity stratospheric air into the middle and upper troposphere, so just like was confirmed for radiosonde data. 
And then the leading edge of this positive potential vorticity infection lowers the heights to the southeast while in northwesterly flow, and therefore you can actually intensify the circulation. So because of the, this development in upper level front, you can actually get these process, processes occurring, and that can help explain the southern and southeastern propagation of this upper level trough if we have an upper level front that did develop. So to test this, we go back to this diagram here and we take a cross section between A1 and A2, so along the northwesterly flow within our geostrophic cold air infection and cyclonic shear. And we use the soy earliest in diagnostic. We actually see here, so I'm gonna take you step by step through this. So at first we have our uh, isentrope uh, that are tilting towards the warmer air, so you can already see this little bit of a tilting that's occurring. On top of this, if we put on our geostrophic isotax, we can see we have about a 70 meter per second jet located right about 250 hectopascals. Located on top of this, if we poke just the cold the geostrophic cold air advection, we notice that we have a strong amount of geostrophic cold air advection to the cyclonic shear side of the jet, which according, should, according to theory should shift the subsidence directly underneath the jet core, and that's actually what you see here. So here that is contoured is the subsidence that occurs because of this upper level front, or this geostrophic cold air advection across the cyclonic shear, located mostly right underneath the jet core. We have the subsidence occurring here, therefore we're gonna expect that the tropopause dips down into a trough. And we can see here, these are our isertels, so this is our PVU units, and we can see that we do have, right in our area of uh, expected expectation, we have this kind of trough, this wall-like feature of higher stratospheric potential vorticity being brought down into the middle and upper troposphere, which again, in northwesterly flow, would help to strengthen the circulation. And to expand on that, this is exactly the same cross-section, although it looks a little different from A1 to A2, same exact uh, vertical axis as well. Everything is the same. We still have our isentropes and our uh, geostrophic ice attacks. But what's different on this plot is this dashed line here that you see, and this is the stream function, <coughs> the geostrophic stream function that you get from using the sawyer Eliasson equation. And we can actually see that we have uh, thermally direct circulation as emphasized by the negative stream function values. A subsidence occurring right where the green is, that's the subsidence, and we have rising motion located on the other side, and we have a pretty strong, about a 2100 uh, stream function value that uh, emphasizes this stronger uh, thermally direct circulation that did form as a result of this upper level front. Again, all putting it together, emphasizing uh, the importance and development of this upper level front. And actually, we can see that this PV air that I just talked about that was subducted down can actually be seen on a horizontal scale. So what you see here is you see 12Z on March 7th. This is the 400 hectopascal geopotential heights. And this is the PV that's located in the 350 to 450 um, hectopascal layer. And then our box region of interest is here. So we can see at 12Z on the 7th, we see right in our location of where we would expect it to be, we have our PV uh, about of a magnitude about four PVU units located right off the coast of California. As it does move to the southeast, we can see it gets a little bit more elongated, located right around California as well. And still, the northwesterly flow is continuing. Geostrophic cold air infection cyclonic shear is continuing. But, however, now by 12Z on March 8th, we notice that the potential vorticity becomes more isotropic. It's becoming closer to the center of the geopotential height minimum at this level. And then if we take it one step, time step further to zero Z on the ninth, we can see that it is almost co-located with the geopotential height minimum. Again, now that we are approaching the base of the trough, we are no longer in this northwesterly flow. And therefore, due to reasons I talked about, we would not necessarily expect it to propagate um, as much farther to the southeast, which at this time, it only propagates a farther by what, about one more day, and then it stops, stalls, and then moves to the northeast, as I mentioned um, before. However, the sawyer eliasson equation, although it does really well at telling us about uh, the dynamics and some of the processes involved in bringing the stratospheric air into the middle upper troposphere and helping to explain some reasons uh, why this actually propagated down to the southeast, it doesn't really tell us quantitatively uh, about the geopotential height changes or what caused the geopotential height changes. Um, so what we really want to do is assess the 500 hectopascal geopotential height changes and uh, more quantitatively. So in order to do that, we have to do what's called a QGPV inversion. So QGPV stands for quasi-geostrophic potential vorticity inversion. It's quite a mouthful. Um, but just to briefly describe the QGPV inversion, so PV is very uh, unique because it has this invertibility principle that we can use. 
And previous study, studies have used um, a PV inversion technique, technique developed by Davis and Emanuel. Though they are not the first to do a PV inversion, they are one of the first studies that really um, use Ertel PV, the full per Ertel PV, to uh, figure out something about the height changes that were associated with the trough. And what pretty much a PV inversion is, is that you can split the atmosphere, in the whole atmosphere, uh, that QG PV, into different subsections of PV. And you can actually uh, examine the influence of those discrete QG PV uh, anomalies to see how they influence the geopotential heights at a certain level. Um, and again, this was, and this was done by Davis and Manuel using the full Ertel PV. Later on, in 1996, a static QG PV inversion developed by Hakem et al. and Nielsen Gemmen Lefebvre, I believe I'm saying it correctly, uh, actually came up with a simpler um, uh, inversion technique that used a more linear set of equations, and therefore, because of that fact, we are, I'm going to perform a static QG PV inversion using, uh, instead of the full Ertel PV because it's simpler, but still gives us really interesting and um, insightful in, uh, insights to the case. So just bear with me, there's a lot of words, but this is the benefits of the QGPV inversion. So again, what you can do is you have the whole atmosphere QGPV. You can then separate this into a mean, over a time mean QGPV, and a perturbation QGPV field. So you can come up with any type of mean, you know, our case is from the 8th to the 12th, so you can come up with a type of mean that calculates the whole level uh, mean QGPV, and then if you take the instantaneous QGPV at one time and subtract it from the mean, or vice versa, you get the perturbation field. But what's interesting is then you can further partition the perturbation field specifically into discrete layers, and each of those discrete layers are associated with um, a mass and momentum field. And when you, what you can do is you can invert this QGPV anomalies in these fields, and you can actually obtain the geopotential height perturbations associated with those geopotential height perturbation fields. And it sounds confusing now, but I promise it'll make more sense in a minute. But it's a framework to quantify the cause and effect interactions um, of the 500 hectopascal uh, geopotential height uh, between different entities. So in other words, we can kind of say what the goal is. You can say the upper level QGP PV anomaly in, uh, contributed more to the 500 hectopascal geopotential changes than the lower level did, or vice versa. It's a way to compare uh, different layers of the atmosphere and figure out which layers uh, and which anom layer anomalies influence the overall cyclone the most. So some specifications. So I mentioned you, can, you have to first separate into a mean and a perturbation field. For this case specifically, we chose to do a bookend mean. So what does that mean? It means that so the case went from March uh, 8th through March 12th, 2016. We took the three days preceding the event, the three days after the event, and we averaged the QGPV between those because, and that became our mean, because then everything in between those two uh, bookend means became part of the perturbation field. So we were able to isolate and strictly place it in the perturbation field, which gives us the most interest and the most insight into what actually occurred during the event. And that is also the same um, Important to mention that's the same technique that was done by Martin Marsili in 2002, and that actually was the uh, inspired the work uh, for this study. So that was a lot of words, a lot of QGPVing, but I kind of created this diagram here to help you really understand it a little bit better. So again, you have your full QGPV. This can then be separated into either your mean QGPV or your perturbation QGPV. So if you once you calculate your mean QGPV, you can put it through this inversion process and you can get your mean geopotential height. For your perturbation QGPV, you can then separate it either, you can either use the whole uh, layer of the atmosphere, so in this case, our, uh, the layer of the atmosphere went from 1,000 to hectopascals to 50 hectopascals and 50 hectopascal increments, but we wanted to really separate it into two main layers. We're gonna consider it the lower layer, so 1,000 to 550 hectopascals, and the upper layer here from 500 to 50 hectopascals. And what you can do is you can separate it into either of these three. You can put it through the inversion process, and then you can actually get the uh, full geopotential height, 500 hectopascal geopotential height perturbations associated with the full QGPV. Or you can get the 500 hectopascal geopotential heights that were contributed by the upper level QGPV anomaly and, or the lower level QGPV anomaly. 
So that is really what we're looking for. We want to compare these three different things, um, these different uh, ideas, and figure out which one, either the lower level or the upper level, contributed more to these changes in 500 hectopascal geopotential height. But there are some catches. In order to use the QGPV system, you must first do checks. And there are two main ones. The first one is a spatial distribution check. So what you see here are um, the full inversion 500 hectopascal geopotential height minimum. So when we had the whole QGPV, we inverted it and we got our geopotential heights. Uh, and that's what you see in these uh, shaded black uh, dots. Then we also compared that to the NCEPT um, final analyses, which were considered as reality or truth for the study. So we want to make sure that our uh, QGPV system actually uh, makes sense and it's followed with reality. And that's what you see with the open circles uh, located to the right uh, of this dot. And so first we have to check and make sure that these two are pretty much spatially uh, distributed uh, near each other. or They're nearly co-located. And you can see pretty much at every instance, except for three, one being here, one being here, and one being here, they are nearly co-located like perfectly with each other. So due to this fact, we can claim that our QGPP system adequately interprets reality, and therefore, spatially, we are good. The second you must do, thing you must do is you must make sure that the uh, magnitude of these geopotential height uh, minimums are roughly the same. And we notice here, there are some slight differences in the magnitudes. However, the uh, QGPV inversion of the full atmosphere is only about 1% greater in magnitude than the NCEP analyses. And therefore, because we have both of these two facts, uh, we can put a big check mark and we can go, OK, our QGPV system is good. We can continue on. So we, now we can go to the further of the partitioning process. So as I mentioned, we are good now. So now we can actually kind of think about what we want to look at. We wanted to specifically look at the 500 hectopascal geopotential height differences, as I mentioned before. And later on, we're also going to investigate in the second research question, the 850 hectopascal uh, poleward geostrophic moisture flux. Um, like I mentioned, that will be talked about more in the second one, but using the same static QGPV inversion uh, technique. So here is an image. I realize it's kind of hard to see. Just bear with me again. So what you are seeing here is the 500 hectopascal uh, full uh, geopotential height perturbations. So these are, uh, you run it through the inversion and you get the geopotential height perturbations and that's what you see that is shaded on these uh, plots. And this is all 0z on the 8th, 9th, 10th, 11th, 12th, and 12 hours later um, on these same days. And what you might also notice here is that there's L's located on each of these subplots and those L's are actually the location of the full inversion 500 hectopascal height, geopotential height minimum. <laughs> so what that means is that the prior slide I just showed you with the checks, the location of that minimum, so the full geopotential height minimum, uh, we, we uh, put a locator on those values, and then we just put that right on top of our geopotential height perturbations uh, you see here. In other words, the L at each of these subplots will not change through any of the analyses. Um, the L stays the same and is constant, and I will explain why in a little bit. But if we continue that, again, the L is staying at the same location of the full inversion, 500 hectopascal height geopotential minimum. Now, on the background, we put on, instead of just the total um, uh, geopotential height perturbations, now we only put the geopotential height perturbations that were contributed by the upper level QGPV anomaly. And that's what you see shaded here. So we can see there's not too much of a difference between the total and the upper level uh, throughout the evolution of this uh, cyclone, but it is slightly weaker, which makes sense. If we go, though, now to the lower level, we see dramatic changes where the geopotential height perturbations at this level are much less, um, which is interesting because that actually can help explain that the upper level QGPV anomaly had a greater influence on the changes in 500 hectopascal geopotential height perturbations. But to more quantitatively look at this on maybe some other maps, because these ones are kind of hard to understand and see, what we did is at the location of that L that remained constant between all three of those um, tests that I just showed you, we recorded that geopotential height perturbations for each of the NCEP analysis for the total perturbation, 
the upper level, at, at upper layer and the lower layer uh, QGPV anomalies, and we plotted that geopotential height perturbation value um, over time at six hour increments uh, throughout the eight, through the eighth through the twelfth, so over the entire period of this evolution of the trunk. And what you see here, which is another great check, is that our NCEPT analysis and our total perturbation um, analysis, the blue and the red, are nearly co-located uh, or well with each other on this graph. And actually, one of my committee members made a really good point to calculate a root mean square error uh, just to show how uh, well they line up. And it was only about a 4.3 meter difference on average throughout the entire uh, evolution. And what you can see here, too, is that the upper layer uh, QGPP anomaly influenced the geopotential height perturbations uh, most similarly to the, uh, to the blue, where it was increasing over time. I thought this was really interesting, is that the lower layer QGPP anomaly actually uh, decreased in magnitude throughout the evolution of this trough, which to me meant that the trough, although becoming more anomalous with its southern propagation, it's not necessarily becoming more anomalous because of its growing in magnitude, because it's actually filling in and weakening over time, with the upper level actually driving most of the, the weakening. However, the lower la layer QGPV anomaly actually, though much weaker, uh, went to actually aid in strengthening the cyclone, which I just thought was really interesting um, to note. And actually, too, what uh, we could do further is instead of just looking at the instantaneous geopotential height perturbations, we can look at a height, uh, 500 hectopascal geopotential height um, tendencies. So what you see here are the six hour differences. So this is hours after uh, 08 March. So we do six hour differences and it's a, um, a forward uh, differencing type of technique. And what we can see, and this is also at the location of the L's. And what we can see here is I just think it's more interesting because it shows us exactly what is changing over time. And we notice that the, again, the blue and the red lines uh, have a root mean square error of only about 5.1 meters, which is great. Um, that means that they line up really well with each other, which we expect because of the other uh, previous analyses. But we also notice that the uh, lower level, lower layer QGPV anomaly kind of oscillates right around the zero meter uh, line, slightly below it, again, and emphasizing it's slightly um, contributing to a strengthening at this level but it doesn't really have much of an influence, whereas the green, the upper layer QGPV anomaly, actually looks more like the total, which is in blue, and therefore, actually, if we go through and we uh, quantify this by uh, summing it all together and doing a ratio between the upper layer and the total and the lower layer and the total um, 500 hectopascal geopotential height perturbation changes, we can say that the upper level upper layer QGPV anomaly accounted for about 73% of the total um, 500 hectopascal geopotential height changes, which I thought was really interesting. And therefore, we can say that this uh, upper layer QGPV anomaly had a greater contribution to the overall impact at this level. Um, but since now we know at least a little bit more about uh, the evolution and, and the propagation of this trough from the, uh, Southern California down to Mexico, we still want to know more about the flooding and how that occurred. So we have to dive then into our second research question, which were what were the mechanisms in, in, that were involved in producing the record-breaking rainfall uh, in eastern Texas, Louisiana specifically um, on March 10th? And you might, might be saying, why March 10th? What's so great about that day? Well, on March 10th, uh, parts of central and southern, uh, northern Louisiana received more than 50% of the rainfall that they received over the entire five-day event. So it was a really interesting day to look at and investigate. And also, as I mentioned before, this date is also when the trough reached its southernmost latitude. So it just became a really interesting event to study. And so if we go back and we look at um, 850 hectopascal geopotential heights, which you see here, that is contoured, we have this uh, box region of interest, that's what we're really going to investigate. And we notice that we have a 850 hectopascal geopotential height minimum located right over central Mexico. This X that you see here, this is the geopotential height minimum, but at 500 hectopascals. So we can already see this type of westward tilt with height located right around this time. And this is 0 on the 9th. If we go 24 hours later, on 0 on the 10th, 
we notice that we do have this propagation down to the southeast, and again, this westward tilt with height still occurs. And we also notice that our flow is extremely meridional, right, located right over our region of interest, um, specifically over Louisiana. It's coming right off the Gulf of Mexico, about a 780 mile fetch of uh, ocean. And so we really wanted to investigate um, this potential uh, poleward geostrophic uh, moisture flux. So that's what we're going to dive right into, is that I really wanted to see um, this, um, investigate more about this geostrophic polar uh, moisture flux. And so the way we're going to calculate the geostrophic polar moisture flux, or PGMF, is very similar to Winters and Martin in 2014, where we're going to just take the V component of the geostrophic wind and multiply that by Q, our mixing ratio at the time. And again, our goal, if we're using um, the same <coughs> static QGPV inversion that I described before, is to quantify the impact of the upper layer and the lower layer QGPV anomalies on this moisture flux, um, specifically at this time at 850 hectopascals. And I also want to note that when we're using the QGPV system, again, this is using VG, um, because Q is constant, I really had to make sure that V and VG were close to each other so we can assume that the moisture flux is uh, a good representation of the geostrophic moisture flux. And V, and because Q is constant, we only need to look at V. And it is important to note that V and VG were only within 2% of each other. And therefore, because of that, and I checked it, um, it was a good representation. And we could continue on with looking at uh, the polar geostrophic moisture flux. And we could use our QGPV system. <coughs> so what you see here, again, zero Z on the 10th. That's the time we're going to be focusing on. This is our 850 um, polar geostrophic moisture flux. So what you see here on the left is our NCEPT analysis. And what you see here is our full inversion. So again, we take the whole QGPV, we invert it, we get our geotensial height per, uh, perturbations, and then we can uh, calculate the polar geostrophic moisture flux from that. And we see, this is just kind of showing you a check again, that even at 850, they look extremely similar to each other. Therefore, we can say we're good, we can go, let's partition this full inversion even more. So we go on and we partition it. So again, we calculate the same bookend mean, we take the same perturbation, and we get this PGMF, uh, PGMF that is located, that looks pretty much just like the ones I just showed you, and that's just because of the uh, idea that we use this bookend mean that everything, therefore, that we're looking at should be in the perturbation field, which you can see it is. And when we take this and we now partition it one step further into the contributions from the upper layer and the lower layer QGPV anomalies, what we notice here is on our left, we have the upper layer QGPV anomaly polar geostrophic moisture flux, and on the right, we have the lower layer. And what we can see is that the lower layer was much less dominant over our region of interest located right in that square box I showed you than uh, the upper layer. Uh, and if you did a ratio by taking these as the numerator and dividing it by the plot that I showed you with the total uh, perturbation field, we can actually get that the upper layer QGPV anomaly accounted for about 60% of the PGMF uh, within our area of interest. Um, which is really interesting because, again, this was consistent even at the 850 hectopascals before we were looking at 500, it is still consistent with the upper layer QGPV anomaly having a dominant influence um, on the polar geostrophic moisture flux. But just because you have the moisture flux doesn't necessarily mean you get all the rainfall. It, it only gives a little bit of the story. So when I looked at the radar image at about this same time on the same day, we noticed that we have this really linear band of convection that occurred, and that actually led me to investigate um, lower level, about 850 hectopascal horizontal frontogenesis, which is shaded here. And we can see that this frontogenesis at this time look, is located pretty much identical, uh, perfectly co-located with that uh, linear band of precipitation that I just showed you. So if we take this and we actually add on our um, negative omega uh, field, we can see that we have a large amount of rising motion located right along that region of uh, horizontal frontogenesis, which you know makes sense with the thermodynamic uh, circulation that does uh, the direct thermo direct the direct thermally direct circulation. Excuse me, that does uh, develop from this uh, horizontal frontogenesis. So if we take a cross section between B1 and B2 perpendicular to that that um, that region of frontogenesis, we see here 
the cross section, we have our uh, isentropes in green, and then we have the, the same uh, chronogenesis occurring here, and then again we have all the rising motion in blue, the omega field located, um, or the negative omega field located right over here. Um, and we can see that we have this really good relationship between the horizontal chronogenesis and the rising motion that does occur, and uh, helping to explain some of the forcing that might actually occur over this region um, to get the precipitation that was occurring. And just to expand on that one step further, if we look at a sounding profile uh, located uh, right at Slidell, Louisiana, we see that we have this uh, sounding that is very uh, closely that very closely resembles a convective, unstable atmosphere with a moist, neutral boundary layer. And uh, I could just go that can be directly related to just this uh, flow from this upper level trough at upper levels going right over the Mexican Peninsula, being brought up for dry air right over across Louisiana like I showed and at the lower level is going over that huge fetch of the Gulf of Mexico and becoming uh, moisture, uh, coming filled with moisture and saturated and that's how you can kind of get this uh, saturated lower levels and drier upper levels and of course therefore you get convective instability and you can get um, uh, the ingredients especially combined with a lifting index of near negative one and cape on the order of a couple hundred joules per kilogram in magnitude all together you can get uh, heavy precipitation and locally intense convection uh, because of these three main uh, factors. So one, you had that 850 hectopascal uh, PGMF that was mainly, mainly driven about 60% by the upper layer QGPV anomaly. You had two, the horizontal frontogenesis that was occurring over the region. And then three, you had this moist unstable atmosphere due to just the location of the trough helping to propagate uh, helping to evacuate some of this air um, at different levels and uh, you get this moist and stable atmosphere so you put all those three together and what you get is a event in which you get a lot of precipitation and you occasionally get some locally intense um, thunderstorms. So just kind of summarizing uh, pretty much everything that I did. Uh, research question one really like uh, investigated this upper level trough and the development and its propagation to the southeast so we had this upper level trough that began to deepen on 08 March and then propagated down um, over southern Mexico in uh, conjunction with an upper level front that did develop. And then using the soil release and circulation diagnostic, we were able to actually uh, physically understand some of the mechanisms that were involved in helping to propagate to the southeast. And again, I just want to reemphasize that um, it's interesting because at first I thought the anomalous behavior of this trough was due to both its magnitude and due to its southern uh, latitude, but it seems to be based on this analysis that it was more due to the southern extent of the trough uh, for this time of year in early March, not necessarily due to its um, increased deepening over time. And again, we had about 73% of the 500 hectopascal geopotential height perturbations being influenced by the upper layer QGPV anomaly in conjunction, which makes sense due to the upper level front that developed and helping to bring in this uh, positive PV air or high PV air into the middle and upper troposphere. So it all kind of worked together in this perfect storm, um, pardon the pun, uh, that came together and actually uh, created this event. And then research question two, we really want to investigate more of the lower layers, more of the forcings that went in to investigate uh, the flooding that specifically occurred in the rainfall. And again, we looked at 850 hectopascal of potential height, uh, the lower layer PGMF, and we saw, found like Similar results for about 60% was due to the upper layer QGPV anomaly. And then combined with horizontal chronogenesis and a moist, unstable atmosphere, all of this worked together and you've got uh, an event that was historic and produced uh, two plus feet of rainfall in these locations. Um, lots of rain, lots of damage, and unfortunately some uh, lives were lost due to the storm. So that pretty much concludes um, my master's work. Um, I did want to give a big shout out to my advisor, Dr. Jonathan Martin. Um, it's been a real pleasure working with him. I've learned an exponential amount, and though I might have always seemed very happy, <laughs> there were definitely some times where I was not. <laughs> um, I uh, also want to give a huge, huge, huge shout out to Melissa. Without Melissa, I would not have been able to complete this at all. Uh, anyone who knows me knows that my technical programming skills are at a first grade level, and so without her help and her coding ability, uh, I would not be here today. So I thank you, and also huge shout out to Coda as well. Coda has helped me immensely uh, with the coding uh, abilities that I do not have, 
And then um, Skylar has helped me too. I also want to give a uh, big shout out to Dr. Michael Morgan. Um, it's been a real pleasure working with you and our research group over the couple, in the last couple of years. And also uh, Brett, it's been great working with you. I appreciate you uh, reading my thesis and being on my committee. And then of course uh, Pete for helping me when I don't know how to do simple things on my computer. And then uh, the whole Martin Research Group, and then friends and family. Um, it's been a real, it's been a real pleasure uh, being here, and uh, I'm really glad that I was able to complete this work uh, with you guys. So with that, I will officially conclude my my talk and open it up for questions. Thank you. Questions for Colin? Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. So I've got two questions. One. I one, I have an idea of what the answer would be, and the other one I don't. Um, so for the uh, first one, can you go back to your time series where you're showing sort of the influence of the upper and lower levels on the intensity of the fire and the Um This one or this one? Uh, the first one, yeah. So this guy, so I'm seeing the upper perturbation is dying off the entire time, and then it's sort of anti-correlated with the lower level. Yes. And until about 78 hours. Right. Um, they cross over and it looks like the lower level perturbation is more driving what's left, right? Um, overall, it's, it's decaying from 12 hours on, but what's left appears to be more of the lower level perturbation. Um, can you tell me in simple terms about the way that PV operates, what's causing this handoff from the upper level to the lower level? Why is it that the lower level is intensifying and the upper level is weakening? Reasons behind that? Yeah. I think that the answer is due to the, the um, preceding analysis when we have this the development of the upper level front helping to bring in this uh, higher PVA that creates a positive PV anomaly at the upper levels. And so based on this uh, positive PV anomaly that had developed over time, I would have thought that, well, two, there's two reasons. One, because of this uh, really strong positive PV anomaly, I would have thought that it would influence the 500 hectopascals more than the lower level uh, QGPV anomaly. But two also, which is a good point to mention, is that, um, and this is something I've mentioned in future, or I will mention in future work, is that um, this is at five, this analysis is at 500 hectopascals, and the upper la uh, layer that we define, 500 hectopascals, is included within that layer. Sure. Um, so by definition, I or logically, you would somewhat expect that the upper layer then would have a greater influence than the lower layer is because of the fact that that level is included in that layer of the QGPV. Sure, but why is the lower level increasing in intensity over time? I guess is maybe another way to put it. What is, what's the driving force behind that? Honestly, I do not know. What is, what would cause the redistribution of the vertical? Um, wait, can you repeat your own question one more time? Sure. If, if you were to, if you were to observe, and maybe using this time series gives you some sort of reflection of an observation that you're that you're losing PV in the upper troposphere and you're gaining PV in the lower troposphere. What's the process that can do that vertical redistribution? Um, There's a one-word answer that, that um, I'm just, I know this is sort of a quiz. I don't know yeah. <laughs> put you on the spot. No, it's okay. Um, Think about your radar image. The, the front end. That's not necessarily the frontogenesis, but what's associated with it? The subsidence, or the rising motion. The convection, right? right. The diabetic heating oh, associated oh, with oh. Your, your monster flooding event. I wonder if maybe what's going on here is you have this very intense upper level trough, and then the convection is packing the lower troposphere with, with PV that sticks around, even as the upper trough goes about its business, does whatever it's doing. Okay. Um, it would be really interesting to see PV plots um, maybe troposphere, maybe dynamic troposphere plots that would show maybe the blooming of the outflow, the, the erosion of the upper level PV, and perhaps the development of the lower level PV. Because I wonder if maybe that's what's going on here. That at, at about 78 hours, your upper level trough is done, right. but it's managed to fire off uh, enough convection that now it's now it's distributed PV into the lower troposphere, and the lower troposphere is now driving what's left. Okay. Right, it's just sort of garbage that's sort of floating along um, as a result. Um, that's sort of what I see when I see this. Okay. Um, my other question, this is the one I, did, I have no idea what the answer would be. So you said this is a, an event with like a return rate of like a 500,000 years or something, right? Something, something like that. 
something crazy. Mm -hmm. um, and the trough itself is not particularly intense. Right. Right. Likewise, I would imagine, I'm, I'm not, correct me if I'm wrong, but the the confluence of cold air advection with you know, northwesterly flow and cyclonic shear is not extremely rare. Yep. It's not certainly not a one in five hundred to one in a thousand year event. So I know that it's as you said, it's the it's the position of this trough, of the latitude of this trough is so anomalous, but why is it we don't see these more often? If none of the important parts of it are all that rare, what is what is it that causes this thing to be so rare? My hypothesis, which was John's hypothesis, <laughs> was, <laughs> um, which we haven't really investigated yet, but it's definitely something to look into, is that specifically for this event, the polar and subtropical jets became um, superposed, superposed, and the substance associated with that superposition event could have um, therefore been a lot stronger than what is normally seen. Okay. And just because of that superposition, combined with just the perfect location of it being in northwesterly flow, um, that's m one of the hypotheses that I can give is maybe because of this extreme subsidence that occurred, because of the superposition, that is one reason why it became so anomalous, um, rather than just having it due to the other. And I would imagine the superposition itself is likewise not, not an incredibly rare event, um, no. but perhaps the, the concert of all these things working together. That's yeah. Yeah. That's it's increasingly right. rare as you go to the eastern part of the Pacific Basin. It's quite common in the western part of the Pacific Basin in the wintertime, even in March, but not so much in the eastern part of the Pacific Basin. So that might be, um, I think you're right, it's a constellation of normal ingredients that doesn't often assemble itself on one stage at the same time that might be this. You know, that would be my Because it would be interesting to find out if the limiting factor is predominantly one of these characters. Yeah, it would. I mean, or the, the interaction of one of these characters. Right, yeah. And then in the background, if I can just follow up, in the background, it's clear with the heights of the 500 volt trough actually increasing rather rapidly, even in the, the analysis, as you can see on the red line there. You're talking about cutting across a boundary that has an extremely sensitive nature to it when it comes to anomaly. So if you get a little bit further south in a certain latitude, suddenly you go from a two standard deviation anomaly when it was off the west coast of, Florida, uh, of the uh, California, something that's 12 standard deviations. That's not because the thing's getting more deep, it's just because it keeps moving southward. Okay. So it's a very sensitive area where you just don't see those kind of other troughs at that latitude. Right? And I wonder if maybe, um, <coughs> sort of when you shoot a cross section, you've got this upper level trough that, that gets us, you know, the dynamic triple loss gets done with 500 yep. the right? It's pretty intense. Um, and it's pretty far south. There's probably a lot of moisture, you know, in that 500 mm bar layer underneath it. Um, does radiation then? Sort of take over as a as a, a important aspect that's going to be modulating the PV at that level. I mean, because you'd have a pretty substantial uh, moisture divergence, right? As you get if you go from look like tropical, almost tropical, tropical tropospheric air directly into the stratosphere at like 500, mm -hmm. I would imagine then that you'd have a, a radiation uh, flux divergence right at the the top of the moisture, which would then cause <coughs> substantial cooling right underneath the trough, and I don't know if that would contribute partially to the help. No, it wouldn't. We could, well, no, they're pulled underneath. Right? Yeah, yeah. Pulled so underneath. it actually might actually help contribute to the type of work. Is that going kind to of be rapid enough in the context of a synoptic evolution? No, I don't. Yeah, yeah I don't either. I, I know in the Arctic when you have long sequestration of these things, and the radiation really does play a major role, exactly the way you're talking about on the top of the moist layer. I don't know if it does with mobile troughs or the sub troughs. It might just be that it doesn't act fast enough to be a major contributor. It certainly pushes things in that direction. I don't know how it could. And then, of course, I mean, that's cool from the top. You're going to get convection. That's going to reach your things that's away That's the difference. The late heating time scales a lot faster. Yeah. yeah. So that's probably why it doesn't make itself known as a major contributor. But that's just a guess. Okay, yeah. yeah, so a couple of questions. Um, on, I guess, a series of plots maybe just before this, you, you do what you call two checks. And so my question is, yeah. what happens if these checks fail? What does it tell you? Uh, it tells me that the, uh, the, the static key should be reimbursed. It's just not a good technique to assess the changes in the or I don't think so. I don't think, I don't think this check, the check either, it works or it doesn't work. If it doesn't work, you have a mistake. There's no way this will never work. 
So that's something to just bear in mind. It's something that as I was reading through your document, I'm trying to figure out is this a check or not, and then it just hit me. I don't think this should never not work because it's a linear problem. What you put in is going to have to come out. That's true. The question, you, know, you might ask the question, is it relevant for um, is the balance assumptions you're making relevant at the latitude? But even that's not going to show up in this check. Right? Uh, are you sure about that? I mean, you're using the analysis. Right. And the results from your full inversion, they, sh they don't necessarily have to be similar. They have, I mean, they have to add up to within machine precision at, at some level, right? Because, Why? Because you're making an assumption. You do so, right? Yeah, well, that's right. Because there's an assumption about, the, sort of about how well the QGPP <coughs> is a good representation of the uh, perturbation height field from the QGPP inversion is the same as the height field from your analysis. I think the heights, since you're putting in a height, since Z is going in, yeah. and it's a linear operator. Again, I'm just trying to think of the solution method. There's nothing in there that says anything about physics of the problem, I think what goes in has to come out. How, how it relates to reality, this geostrophic balance and if an appropriate balance to use for this, I think is a, is a different, not a different beast. I guess I gotta think about that some more. But the height from the answer of analysis is constrained by the geostrophic balance. Right. Yeah, so right. You can, couldn't they be different based Yeah, the height from the analysis can be a result of a lot of unbalanced flows or things that are far from geostrophy, especially in southern Mexico. So you, and you only use height to go into this, right? Yeah. Right, you don't use the winds. Okay. So I'll take that. Uh, so this is, okay, so this, this is what these are. You're going to, I think you know, you're going to check, you, you're going to, yeah. you want to do it, but I, I'm just I'm wondering how, how off that's going to be. The second question is, when you look at the, near the end, when you're looking at the circulation near the front, mm -hmm. um, you show a nice overlay of the vertical motion and the front genesis, but I think, if you're thinking about publication for this, use your Soriolius and solver for the surface front because that will give you everything you need to know about that front, I think, and the circulation. It's, it's, a, it's a more rigorous thing. A lot of people do that to do what you've shown there, but I think you already have a tool to, to do it, so just do it. Okay, let's get some that. Nice presentation. Yeah, you can, in fact, using that tool, you can pull out what's non semi geostrophic and what part of the vertical motion that comes out of the non semi geostrophic is actually there in the full omega. So you could maybe actually say something directly about the non semi-geostrophic part of the flow and its influence on the vertical motion. I had a question too about the frontogenesis cross-section. One of the things I've noticed over many years is that when one looks at vertical cross-sections of frontogenesis, and this is the total wind doing it, I presume, right, so it's the full wind frontogenesis, yeah. Usually that top piece that has the really high magnitude, if you were to split that into geostrophic and ageostrophic, just a simple split like that. That part survives probably as mostly geostrophic. And the lower level disappears in the geostrophic frontogenesis. It's probably all ageostrophic. So another interesting thing you could do here, it's along the lines of what Michael just suggested, that's why my ears perked up, is that you could um, take a look at what part of that geostrophic frontogenesis, which I'm presuming is fairly large in the middle troposphere from 600 millibars up to 400 millibars, how is that being placed? in your QGP inversion. Just take the full thermal field and put the two winds on top of it and see what's, what piece is contributing what. Uh, presumably the upper level uh, PV perturbation will once again come to the to the rescue on this day, I think, and provide the majority of that middle and upper tropospheric force. That'd be interesting. And then you, then you have a story that says, I've got ageostrophy going on in the lower boundary, naturally. That's usually what happens in the front, frontal environment, the lower boundary. But then it's aided in this case by a potent um, QG part of the circulation that drives that updraft. It makes it really deep, and that leads to your really stupendous precipitation event. Right? So, and then it leads to another set of questions we could ask, which is, what's the diabatic part of the, of the inversion here? What part of the height field at all these levels is the result of the diabatic heat? And Brett was getting at this sort of, when he's asking about the 850 nova, uh, or the lower level um, height perturbation. You could really probably put some more icing on the cake, some more insight can come if you put the diabetic terms and inverted that. Yeah. The nice thing about the inversion is that you can do, now that it works, <laughs> you can do anything you want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you just got to be careful on how you calculate the diabetic heating. And right. then once you have it, you just have this big volume of a value and you can say, tell me what the heights are. Right. Which is great. Yeah. Sorry, I want to correct something I said earlier. Yeah, you're right. The, because you're, there's a, F, a factor of F or 1 over F or F naught that you use. Calculation of the QGPV, you have to do that check. Okay. 
Yeah. I, I'm glad for, because the, the papers and stuff, they all did the checks. Okay. Right. That's good. Right. Well, but when it comes to spatial distribution, it's probably a better check than just looking at the location of the two the right. right? I mean, you, you have the entire two dimensional field. Um, mm -hmm. And I think I mentioned this in the comments too, that maybe looking at a box around the. Yeah, well, I think maybe just doing showing a plot, like a two-dimensional plot that's that's like the errors, you know, the differences would be valuable because you might then see, for example, they're concentrated in lower latitudes, they're concentrated where you know you have connection or point. In the adjoining ridges, where it's possible. Yeah, yeah. 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 I think yeah, I think they play a, a role. Um, just think about that. Yeah. Well, one other thing. So <laughs> you should show the moisture flux. I think it's great that you do the partitioning of it. But the moisture flux by itself, and I know you look at the front genesis of it, is insufficient. It's the convergence or divergence of that will tell where is that water vapor also right, being deposited spatially. And so if you look at the gradients of the lower level, the inversion to the lower level winds, and one to the upper level winds, that might tell you something more right. than just the flux itself. Yeah. Now maybe, um, now I was thinking as this was being presented today, because every time I see it, I think of new <laughs> things. Um, and I want to talk about the sound of it too. But the, um, uh, what if you didn't do a divergence, but you said, I'm going to draw a line zonally at 35 degrees, and I want to see how much is flux polar to there. I don't care what happens after that, but, uh, you know, because there'll be frontogenesis, will make it a little more complicated how you actually get the convergence and what do you attribute it to. But how much moisture flux is accomplished north of 35 degrees by those two positive perturbations? Because that's really different than saying what's going on in the box. Right. I don't really care so much about the box. I care about getting it towards that point, right. and how much can I attribute to that? And then doing your ratio. Right. Yeah. So, I don't know if that's but I guess the, the, like I mean, compromise or it's just you, wrong. You cross one line, but then if the, if the same amount goes out but the northern part of the box, then it doesn't really matter how strong the flux is because there's no, assuming nothing's going on the sides, there's no net transport to the box. You're not going to accumulate. Yeah, but what if you've got a, a dynamical feature in there like the front that's, that's processing water vapor once it gets there? Will it, will it, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong about this, but I'm thinking that if you're just taking the winds dotted with the, or multiplied by the, by the mixing ratio, um, maybe you don't notice where it gets stocked in that in that north of possession. But maybe you do. I think it's, 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 yeah, if you, you do. And I'm looking really at what so everything's at one level, but yeah, if you yeah, yeah. if you'd assume that, then you yeah, have the divergence of that is going to tell you this is where the Q is increasing or decreasing locally. Yeah. And then you can say it's a particular out or is it increasing yeah. so it can be processed. In fact, it looks like by eye you get that diverge, that convergence maximum would be right along your front line. That's right. And that's, that shows up like in the picture. That. It shows yeah. up in the picture. It yeah. looks yeah. like that. But I would kind of call it a material barrier. And yeah. 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 yeah that's, a, that's a good point. And then the sounding. Can we look at the sounding yes. quickly? And yet, again, something new I noticed I hadn't noticed before. This is a moist neutral sounding. Mm -hmm. um, as long as you can overcome the dry cap, which you can. And the dry cap's there because the flows come off the, the, uh, off the Mexican uh, plateau in a couple of days before. But look at from. 500 millibars up to 350. Suddenly the lapse rate gets almost dry adiabatic while it's dry. So you've got this really intense mixed layer at very high levels. Um, and that's going to provide just a little more of a punch. If you get enough draft that's already coming up, it's going to say, oh my god, I got a perfect, I'm like almost a dry neutral uh, lapse rate here. And I'm already moving along a moist isotrope. That's wild. So you get this, maybe this extra kick. So some of the traditional um, parameters like lifted index and cake. I don't think they quite tell you the story, maybe, on the way that the air is actually uh, stratified leading into the frontal uh, circulation. It's just interesting how all the, it all came together <laughs> this one event. All yeah. was perfect. Yeah. And then the last comment I have is it'd be nice to just take a look at a series of you know, 50 years or 70 years of the end analysis data and find how many troughs get past this threshold where you get almost by being a trough, you're a six standard deviation. Feature. What do the soft evolutions look like in those? Uh, I don't know how important the ridges joining the, the basin are, or, or if it's just the northwesterly flow or anything that gets to Brett's original question. These are normal, kind of average, run of the mill ingredients right. that came together in a funny way to produce this event. How frequently does that actually happen? Right. Whether, whether or not you, know, you think about the rain amounts only, right. like these one in a thousand. Years. So it'd be interesting. That would be Did the truck become more or less homeless as it um, increased the mountains? You know, I'm just wondering if, uh, I'm not you don't see too many troughs that make their way that far south, and I'm wondering how the terrain compares that portion of the Rocky Mountains or the Little Rockies versus what we see further north, um, just in terms of the vortex stretching aspect of how that all comes together. Do you know what the terrain, how the terrain compares? 
I know uh, between like the Rockies and the, like over in Mexico. We, right, because we see a lot of troughs that come over the Rockies, you know, from Colorado. Right. Um, but we don't seem to see too many that come over the Mexican Rockies. Right. And I'm just curious if, if you're getting the difference, there's a difference in the enhancement of the vortex structure that you get that far south versus further north. Did the Mexican plateau, them, they're definitely lower than the Rockies. Lower. Yeah. Yeah, 10,000 um, feet to the plateau, so that's probably about the peak of the Mexican Rockies. Right, yeah. And then the other interesting thing is when that upper trough does finally start to cross the spine of the Mexican Rockies and plateau, that's when the lower level signal shows up better in the PV, but it starts to disappear in the height fields. Yep. It's really interesting. interesting. Any other questions or comments? Okay, thank you, Carl.